Hello and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Now a video people have requested and that is putting connectors on the ends of your coax that you might use, the cable you use for your uh, cloverleaf antennas or whatever. And the most common connector we find these days is a thing called the SMA or the RPSMA connector. Now I've done a little video on the difference between the two, but what I'm going to show you today is how to attach a connector uh, SMA connector to one of some of this RG402 semi-rigid coax. Remember semi-rigid means you can bend it and it stays bent. Just the thing for FPV antennas on your models. Now I've made an antenna up here, you, I've done a video on this as well before, but what I'm going to show you is how to put the connector on. They come in bags like this, get them on eBay, cheap as beans. I forget the price but uh, you know, next to nothing. And once you take a set out of the bag, all you really have are these two pieces here. And those pieces are the, the body of the connector and there's this little pin. Now this is the only difference between an SMA and an RPSMA. With an SMA connector this pin is solid and with an RPSMA connector then there's actually a sort of a, a, a hole, it becomes a, a tube into which the pin on the other end pokes. So this is the male which is a standard SMA, the other one is a female which is an RPSMA. Now, you'll see later on as to what the difference is but there's the body and of course we have our coaxial cable here. And putting these together is actually incredibly simple, no special tools required, all you need is a soldering iron, a little dexterity and a little bit of practice. So the first thing we do is we cut our coaxial cable as you can see here, it's cut so that we've got in this case around about four millimeters of wire poking out past the, um, the, the inner which I've cut back, I've paired back. So you can see that this is actually a uh, um, uh, the inside conductor is a solder conductor, there's a braid on the outside which is all sort of soldered together and so we've just got that inner poking out, we've cut back the insulation and the braid because this little piece here is going to go inside the pin, there's a little hole in the pin and we can actually slide one inside the other, I'm going to have to put my glasses on to do this because I'm getting really old and it's really hard to see this stuff without, oh these glasses, I have to reach over here, should have prepared better, oh never mind, um, I can put the pin over the little, and it's probably going out of focus because I've got it on manual focus for this, this slides over here like so, oh, not so easy when you're trying to do it on camera, there we go. So now you can see I've slid the inner copper inside the little pin and there's a little hole on here, if we were to get it really close we'd see there's a little hole through which we can pour some solder if we need to. But what I tend to do, eh, trying to pour solder on once you've done it is not so easy, so first thing to do before you even slide this over here is to tin that piece of wire. Now the wire is already tin but it's only got such a very thin layer of solder on it that it wouldn't actually do very well when you put it in the little piece of gold. So what I'm going to do, well it's hard to do from the wrong angle I've got to tell you, is I just flow some solder onto that like so. So now I have a nice fresh layer of solder on there and now I should still be able to connect, put my pin onto there but of course if I put too much solder on it'll be too big, it's just a case of getting the right amount. There we go. So after tinning that I've slid the little piece of gold plated thing back over the wire and now I'm going to apply a little bit of solder and a bit of heat, try and do it so you can see on the camera, there's the solder and a bit of solder through the little hole there, quick as I can, there we go, that should now have soldered that pin to the inner, I can check it because if I put my pliers on here it's not going to come off, which is great, that's what I wanted to see. Now what often happens when you do this however, is you end up with a bit of excess solder will flow around the outside, hopefully this is in focus, there's a bit of excess solder flow there, I get my knife and I just scrape that extra solder off because that pin is going to have to go inside that hole in there in our little body and if there's too much solder on there it won't go right through, so I'm going to give that a little scrape now with my knife, just take the excess off because the solder is quite soft so it will come off quite easily and it just makes for a better job, hopefully I'm keeping this in focus and in the centre of the screen because I can't look at everything at once, here we go, scraping that solder back and of course if you really ace with the soldering on you probably don't have to do this but uh, you're probably going to be even worse than I am and that's paired that back now so that the outside isn't all cluttered up with lots of excess solder and it's important to check at this stage that none of the solder you scraped off actually contacts onto the end of the braid. Now you can see there there's no solder in this area here joining the inside to the outside, that's all nice and clear because you don't want a short circuit on here, that'll ruin your day, ruin your day. Now the next step is to do a dry fit with your little body here, so make sure that this actually fits on and you'll notice it goes and then it should slide on quite a bit further, push it fully home and if you look down inside you'll see that the little, in this case the male portion actually protrudes quite a way through and it comes up to within a couple of screw threads of the top of the actual body of the connector. 
Then we pull that off again because we haven't soldered it on and it puts some heat shrink on. Now it's important to remember to put the heat shrink on before you solder the connector on or you'll kick yourself over and over again because once you've soldered these connectors on they're not easy to get off as you'll see. So we need to put our heat shrink over the coax like so. Don't push it as far up as possible so it's not going to be affected by the heat of soldering. Then you can slide this back on, pushing it right home. And you'll see that again, there's a little hole in here. Hopefully this is, I'm on manual focus, so I don't know if it's focusing. There's a little hole there, which we're going to allow, allow us to wick some solder through. Now, I don't bother too much with that hole. I like to put a little bead of solder around the edge. Now I'm going to try and do this. It's going to be a complete and utter mess because all the focus will be out and no doubt things will not work as planned. But I'll put it on this little block here. Let's see if I can focus again to get, oops, get my hand out of the way. Get a decent focus so you can see what's happening. Um, I put it on this block, which is actually just a, a whetstone, so that it's not going to melt my bench when I solder it. And you'll see that I have changed the iron tip. I've got a bigger tip on my iron. It's the same iron, but a bigger tip because I want to transfer as much heat as possible into the body and the coaxial screen in the shortest possible of time. So a small tip would soon, with a smaller contact area, it's not going to transfer the heat as quickly. So you end up with a much messier job. So let's have a go at this, see if I can make it work. Now it's important that your tip is nice and clean. So I've wiped it on my little thing and it's all shiny, shiny, shiny. And I'll now put my granny glasses on and try to do this without embarrassing myself. Now the voice is going to change because I'm bending over my microphone. So the secret is just to get it a bit wetted and then get the heat flowing. And pretty soon, oops, here we go. I have to use many, many hands here. Get the coax heated up, get the body of the connector heated up, and then just flow the solder. I'm doing a really lousy job here, probably moving out of shot even, but if you do it properly, it'll flow around, make a nice, neat, and it even goes with that little hole there, see? And now it should have flowed around and made a nice, neat little thing. There's a bit on the back I haven't got due to the effects of gravity, so I'll go around here. Do the same again here, try and flow this around while staying in shot, which is probably a complete epic fail in that respect. Oh, come around the side so I can turn the coax as I apply the heat. So now it should all just solder nicely. There we go, hopefully I've got some of that in shot. You can see there's no spiky bulgy outy bits, there's no nasty bits, it should be a nice smooth solder all the way around there. If it's got some little spikes you can actually cut those off with a knife. Well, put them down with the soldering iron. But there we go, that's soldered that. And now of course the next thing is just to move the heat shrink up and shrink it into place. And of course to heat shrink the heat shrink, I use my little hot air reflow, wonderful little tool. This never run out of uses for this little thing. And I can just heat that heat shrink up and it'll pull down nicely and give a very professional looking job here. There we go, that's it, done. I have connected the connector to my homemade cloverleaf antenna and the RG402 coax, the semi-rigid coax. Simple as that, really a piece of cake. Do it yourself. I mean, people can, you can buy the little pre-made uh, pigtails, but they generally don't have RG402 on them. They only have the cheaper uh, RG316, which is the super flexi stuff. That is a higher loss and it's not much use really if you want to have a nice antenna on your mini quad. But there you go. Now I'll be doing another video showing you how to crimp RG316, which is the thinner coax, but I thought this one, I'll do it first. Simple, don't be scared. These connectors are cheap, the cable's cheap. Practice. If you, if you stuff a few up, don't worry about it. It's just, you know, there's plenty more left in the bag. There you go. Little tip though, if you're buying from eBay vendors and they offer to sell in bags of 10 and you want 20, do not buy two bags of 10 at once. Because as I found out, they just send you one bag, even though you paid for two. And when you complain, they say, tough. <laughs> so um, make two separate orders. It's free shipping, so you don't have to pay extra shipping. Just place two separate orders, two separate payments for two bags of 10 rather than uh, have ordering two bags of 10 at once. There you go, simple. Questions, comments, put them on the bottom of the video. Usual stuff. I shall try to read all the comments. I shall try to answer the questions if I see any that I know the answer to. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Now it's time for me to get back to the bench.